Okay, so uh, all right, thanks for having me. Uh, my name is uh, Sandro Coretti Drayton. I uh, am a research fellow at IOHK. I've been there um, for uh, since uh, 2019. And uh, <clears throat> yeah, before that, I did a postdoc in, uh, in New York at NYU. Uh, and I got my PhD from, uh, from ETH Zurich. Uh, the, uh, my advisor was Willie Meyer. So I'm going to talk about uh, fast isomorphic state channels, sort of a layer two solution for blockchains to improve scalability. Uh, this is joint work with uh, a bunch of people from IHK, Manuel Chakravarti, Matthias Fitzi, Philip Kant, Peter Gaggi, Agros Kiyas, and uh, Alexander Russell. Um, all right. So <clears throat> what, as I said, what we're sort of <clears throat> uh, trying to do here is uh, to improve blockchain scalability. So I like, guess we've, we've all seen this. So on, uh, and it applies uh, to a bigger or lesser extent to most uh, blockchains out there. So they, you know, you need to store a lot of stuff as the chains grow. Um, so storage is an issue. Um, you often have uh, quite a low throughput because, you know, you, for example, you have to wait for it some uh, with publishing blocks uh, to be sh so that you're sure that um, you know previous blocks get delivered, um, and uh, you know you also have high latency, especially with uh, Nakamoto-style uh, blockchains where you, know, you have to wait until a transaction reaches a certain depth uh, before it before you can consider it uh, confirmed. So the, the approach to scalability that we take here is that of uh, multi-party state channels. So basically imagine that you have the uh, main chain with its ledger and uh, there are some people um, that are interested in a, in, a, in a subset of this ledger. And what they, what, what they wanna do is basically you know, cut that Substate of the ledger uh, out and uh, take it off chain and then evolve it off chain in, in their own protocol, which will be uh, a lot quicker than, than the main chain. And then uh, once they're done, or in case something goes wrong, they want to be able to, you know, um, get this uh, evolved ledger back uh, to the main chain. And what kind of uh, security goals uh, do we expect here? So very roughly, uh, we want safety, which means that, for example, even if you're the only uh, one of these parties uh, that that is honest, that follows the protocol and everybody else cheats, you don't wanna have any bad effects. So you don't wanna lose any money uh, that you may have received uh, uh, in this off-chain protocol. Um, also important if you know all of these uh, parties are that, that maintain this uh, off-chain protocol. If all of them are uh, dishonest, then they should at least not be able to, uh, you know, generate any funds or make money out of nowhere. Um, so, or in particular, they should not be able to to break the the main chain by by whatever they're doing there. Uh, the other thing is liveness. So, if nobody cheats among these uh, off-chain parties, then uh, we want that. You know uh, the off-chain transactions are become confirmed and are processed properly. Um, and so what we're going to try to do here is you know have a protocol that works really really fast in this uh, optimistic case. So when everybody's honest, and if something goes wrong, uh, we're going to fall back to the main chain and uh, you know rely on the main chain to to resolve problems for us. All right, so. Uh, so the crucial ingredient for, or what we build on top of, is the UTXO models, uh, the UTXO model. Uh, so as it's used, for example, in Bitcoin. Um, so the in the UTXO model, you you look at you know transactions, you look at their outputs, um, and so typically, you know, you can say, uh, um, can you actually see when I point with my mouse? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, so, uh, typically you have some, some funds, some coins, uh, and then here you have the public key under which they are locked. 
And if you if you now want to you know spend these output these uh, transaction outputs, um, you can create a new transaction that has as inputs you know uh, some of the some of these outputs. And what happens during this validation is uh, basically you know it is checked that this transaction is signed by um, you know for, for, so for each output that you spend it's checked that um, the transaction is signed under the corresponding public key so this this in this example the, this transaction has to be signed by public key one and public key seven right? they appear multiple times here <clears throat> but for each UTXO that you that you consume this check is being executed and for, for you know let's just think for the stock as sort of this set of public keys uh, under which there was a valid signature that, that's provided as sort of part of this transaction. Um, all right, so, and of course, the other, the second thing that you need to check is that, you know, the, the sum of all the inputs in terms of money equals the, the sum of all the outputs. Now, if you want to add uh, sort of smart contract functionality to the you, uh, to the UTXL model, you, you can consider the extended UTXL model, uh, which uh, was introduced uh, by uh, Manuel Chakravarty and some others uh, very recently. And what changes is that instead of being locked with the public key, uh, your outputs are now locked with a validator script. Um, <clears throat> in addition to that, each output also contains some data and now when you do the transaction validation, um, you, for each output that is consumed, you, have, you, you run the corresponding validator. And if the validator says, uh, if the validator accepts, then, uh, you know, for, for all of these uh, UTXOs that you spend, then the transaction uh, is valid. Now, the question is, what is the input uh, to, to each validator. So let's, let's look, you know, let's assume we run this new one. So it gets to see as input, this whole context here that's in orange. Uh, and some of the things I uh, haven't explained it. So each, for each of these uh, UTXOs that you spent, uh, there is an additional sort of redeemer value, which you can use, you know, just to supply uh, additional witnesses that may be required to to spend to spend a particular output, um, and also what's very practical, what's very useful, uh, each transaction comes with a time window during which it can uh, be included in the in the in the ledger, um, and so it, it, it will be important that so if you you will not learn the actual time when it was included, but you you have these two bounds, and these two bounds can also be an input to to the validator. And of course, again, you need to check that the sum of the input equals the sum of the outputs. So you can see now that you know this at least generalizes the pay to pub key um, that you have in the normal UTXO model, right? Because then the validator could simply check um, that it's signed under the appropriate signature. But it's now much more. Powerful. Isn't yes. this how Bitcoin uh, works anyway with Bitcoin script since the beginning? Right, but uh, if I understand it correctly, uh, they don't have any data, so you can't actually keep state. Oh yeah, okay. So this delta is updatable somehow. Right. So I'll I'll show you. So it, it's it's you can build an abstraction on top where you can think of this delta as being updatable. But of course, in the UTXO model, you know, basically all you have some data here. And then I guess if you want, you can use a store new state in these other deltas in general, right? But this is just a general example. So I'll show you a sort of a, a, a state machine example where you, know, you can think of the delta as keeping the state of the state machine, which you can sort of update with every, every transition that you make. Okay. Right. All right. Um, Okay, so so there is oh, sorry, there's that. The other uh, very useful thing is that um, the extended UTXO model supports uh, native multi-currency. So the the thing where up until now you've seen numbers is actually uh, something more general. It's a set of values, if you want, um, where you can have any kind of token in it. So here I'm showing you like 
two different uh, types of tokens. So the, the tokens coin here, that's like a, a currency. So these are fungible tokens. So you have a currency identifier. And then when you have a fungible currency, you have one type of token. For example, here, you know, it contains three tokens of currency coin. Um, and then you can define any kind of non-fungible tokens. Uh, so this is, would be the, the identifier of the currency that corresponds to, to a particular type of non-fungible tokens. And then you'd have like, you know, different tokens, T1, T2, and so on. And you can add them. So, you know, if you have two such, two such sets, basically for the fungible stuff, you know, um, it just, you know, you, you just add up the, uh, the numbers here. And for the non-fungible stuff, you just compute the union of these sets, and, and, you know, at least intuitively, right? Because basically they're non-fungible. So you can't like, they're not interchangeable. Now, if we go back to where we were before, so, uh, and add these multi-currencies. So basically what happens gonna happen is all these numbers here get replaced by general values. Um, so, and then when you check, you, you do your sum check, you actually do it, you know, you add things up the way I just showed you. And also important, you can now forge new tokens in a transaction. And when you do that, um, for every token you forge, uh, you know, uh, the currency has a corresponding monetary policy that's going to be called on your transaction. And it's going to determine whether you're actually allowed to do that um, or not. So, so this is basically sort of a more or less complete picture of the extended UTXO model. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, it has some advantages here. Uh, so one is, you know, if you, you'll see that this, if you use this to implement like state machines um, as, a, as an example, then your, your state is always local, which is different from you know, like uh, the accounts model where this, this sort of the ledger state is global, um, you know, different contracts can talk to each other and so on. So here, this is, it's, it's easier to handle um, and also easier to reason about uh, the correctness of these things. Um, one other thing is that you can always predict uh, the transaction fees um, because when you create this transaction, you know exactly the computation that is gonna that is going to be run on these uh, for each of these validators because the you know the inputs are they're already known when you submit the transaction, which is also different from like uh, an accounts based model where you know some other transaction might write to uh, to the to the contract account that you're interested in and this cannot happen here. So if if some you know the, the worst thing that can happen is some other transaction spends this output before you, but then your transaction is just uh, going to be rejected, but it's not going to be that you're going to have a completely different computation that might be longer and then you didn't provide enough gas. So that's another advantage of the extended UTXO model. Um, and as I just said, it has native multi-currency support, which means that uh, you don't have to run or invoke a smart contract every time you want to, um, you want to transfer a non-native <clears throat> non currency. Or a, uh, a, a non fungible token. So, I guess, uh, are there any questions about this uh, model? Is there any limit on the size that you or what you can encode in the state part of the transaction? Um, I mean, just uh, the transaction size in, in general, but um, I guess that's a parameter of uh, whatever system you use. And then I want to ask, like, how how rich is this language? Like, can you, for example, express complex ownership, such as DAOs, that you can do in Ethereum, or is it like a more limited thing? No, the the language is Turing complete. So, uh, I mean, again, I'm I'm going to show you like a simple like state machines that you can implement, but you can basically do any computation that, that you want. And then uh, the the deltas here are they? Like who can access these deltas? Can it? Can they be accessed? Yeah, who has access to access these deltas among the validators? So, right. So, basically, um, if 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 you have these outputs here, um, 
you can create any kind of transaction. And the only thing that matters is that your validator says yes. And again, the input to the validator is everything that is shown here in orange. So, um, so maybe this is a little general and it, it will be much more, uh, it will be easier to understand if I give you like this, the state machine example. So it gives you a better intuition about what, what is possible. Okay. okay. So, so let's do that um, right now, actually. So the, you know, consider, you know, simple state machine, you have maybe a state name and you have some memory. And then upon input I, the, the, you know, you get to a different state, a state prime, and uh, you can update your memory um, to M prime. And just, you know, imagine all you need here is some predicate P that takes all these things as an input and tells you whether this is a valid state transition. Right. So now if you wanted to sort of build this in the EUTXO model, so, so up here is the, the abstraction. So down here, um, you can have, you can have, uh, you would have a transaction and in its output, so that the data field here, it would simply, you know, contain uh, what is in here. So basically the state name and the memory, if you will. And then it's locked with this uh, special validator that corresponds to the state machine. We'll get to that in a second. Now, if you want to make a state transition, um, you would write sort of this input. This would this would go in. Oh, like that. So go into this redeemer field, and uh, the new state would go here in the data field. And now comes the important part. So this this validator here it checks two things. One is that you know the predicate p is satisfied, and the 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 other thing is that it makes sure that you know the the spending transaction again has the same the same uh, validator in it. So that it basically guarantees that you keep running the state machine. So is it, we're going to add some features, but I, I hope this gives you a better sort of idea of you know uh, what you can do with this. So one thing is that, you know, if you, we already have like these transactions and they contain some value. So we can actually incorporate in this into the state machine abstraction. So we can have state machines that can hold money, right? So it's like, a, you know, analogous to a smart contract, you know, in Ethereum having money in it. Um, and then, uh, what we can also do is, you know, we've seen that transactions always come with uh, a, a list of public keys under which they were signed. Uh, they always come with this uh, window that sort of gives a guarantee um, about when the, the transaction happened. And it comes with, you know, uh, some possibly some forged tokens. So we can also incorporate again this into our, into our uh, state machine model. And it will, uh, you know, it's just something in addition that the predicate here can check. So you can now have a state machine where only a certain set of people are allowed to do um, a state transition, uh, where state transitions can only happen in a particular time window. And where you can also, you know, base the validity of your uh, transition on which tokens were forged. Okay. So I don't know, Dionysus, does this kind of answer your question from before? Yes, and then uh, the one thing that is a little, a little unclear here is that where does the forge, forging policy or monetary policy live? Is it outside of these validators somewhere? Yeah, it's just think of something that's stored on chain somewhere. And uh, okay, you know, there's. I guess there, I could there, read Ethereum here. The, the difference is that one smart contract doesn't have access to other smart contract states. In the EU TXO model, you mean? Yeah. 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 Right. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay. Um, all right. So, so we have this, and then one last thing we can do is, you know, the the transaction here that correspond that basically creates the state transition. It can itself have inputs and outputs, right? And then we can think of, you know, the inputs as bringing value uh, into the state machine, and we can think of the outputs as, uh, you know, value leaving the state machine and, and actually like, you know, we can create particular UTXOs here as, as part of the, 
what comes out of the state machine. So basically this is gonna be the, the abstraction that we work with here. So if you have any questions, I guess about this, uh, I'm happy to answer them now. If not, uh, let's look at how we actually do things. So, right, so let's go back to you know, basically the ledger on the main chain. We have these uh, transactions here with the, with the UTXOs and now they're gonna be in these you know, bunch of people here that we talked about before. Those are the people that want to take some substate of the ledger off chain. And uh, so what they're gonna do is one of them is gonna deploy this state machine on the main chain. And uh, we'll see more details about how this works in a, in a few moments. But basically the idea will be to commit or to you know, deposit these UTXOs into this state machine. And then once this is done, um, this UTXO set kind of appears in the head in this off-chain protocol. And the parties run this off-chain protocol and this UTXO set evolves. And uh, important here is that basically it uses the exact same ledger model as, as on the main chain, right? So the exact same type of transaction and so on. And, uh, you know, at some point, either the parties decide it's enough, we, we want to close this head or something goes wrong because one of the parties cheats. So then there is this protocol is designed in such a way that there will be a short um, certificate whose length is independent of the transaction history in, in this head. They can be sent back to the state machine. And then ultimately, you know, the state machine will make sure that this final UTXO set that you had um, in the head, in the head protocol here, uh, will appear on the main chain. So this is the uh, high level approach. And uh, so now we're next, we're gonna look at this uh, state machine and see a few more details about it. And then after that, um, I'll show you what happens in this uh, uh, off-chain protocol here, which we call the head. All right. Um, so the, the state machine that runs on the main chain, it basically starts in this initial state uh, it just, the initial state sets up some things like, you know, parameters of the, of the head and it also important like the keys of the head members. So uh, like uh, everything that happens in this state machine, uh, you know, only members of the head can actually uh, create state transitions and so on. So the initial transaction contains these public keys, which will, which will use to basically have some kind of access control. Um, and then we go from this initial to open. And during this open, um, we're gonna somehow commit UTXOs into this state machine. Um, and we'll do this in sort of a, an efficient parallel way so that all the head members can commit UTXOs at the same time. And because doing this sequentially would, would take way too much time because basically every, if you do it sequentially, you need one state transition per, per head member. And if you have, you know, even if you have, 20 head members that would take quite some time already. Um, so we'll see how that works in a minute, but let's just look at the rest of this state machine. So once the head is in this open state, basically that's when the off-chain protocol starts running. And then, as I said, when the parties are done or if something goes wrong, any of them can provide this certificate and basically go into this closed state. Um, and then, you know, for the cases where the party that closes the head provides an outdated certificate, we give the other guys a chance during some contestation window to, to uh, provide newer certificates. And then after this contestation period is over, um, there's a final transition that will make uh, the final UTXO set uh, from the off-chain protocol available on the main chain. So this is the uh, this is basically what happens on the main chain, uh, and now, so uh, unless there are any questions, so we're gonna look at how we do this uh, um, this commit operation here. And so remember, if you take the state machine, uh, there will be some transaction that actually establishes this initial state on the chain, 
and it will have this uh, special output here that implements the state machine. But now we're also for, for every head member, when, so in our example, we have four. So we create a sort of a dedicated output here. And we also <clears throat> forge uh, these non-fungible tokens here, which are basically participation tokens. And they're of, you know, just uh, of a currency that's uh, related to the, to, the, uh, to the state machine. So the idea is now that each of these head members can post a commit transaction here uh, where, uh, first of all, this, you know, it has a single output, this token will end up here and necessarily, and then it can commit any other UTXOs from the main chain into this thing here. And then information about what was committed is stored in the data field here. So that later you'll see the state machine knows about it. And the validator here that locks this output, it basically checks that, you know, this goes back into the state machine. So what does mean? What does it mean to go back in the state machine? Well, you know, there's going to be a transition uh, transaction, if you want, uh, that goes from initial to open. It basically has to spend the state machine output. And it, the state machine will enforce that all these participation tokens make it back into um, the state machine, which will ensure that whoever does this transition from initial to open actually has to, uh, you know, collect all the commit transactions from all the head members. And now, this, so this is how the information about um, all these committed UTXOs ends up uh, as part of the state of the state machine here. So yeah, so th this gives you basically this because this can happen in parallel. You know, you need like if your network or if your confirmation delays like delta, you need like two delta uh, for this entire thing, as opposed to you know. Uh, n times delta if you have n head members. So this will speed up things quite a bit. All right, uh, are there any questions about stuff on the main chain? Yeah, um, with the these commitments, so you're essentially, when you commit, I guess it means that the, the corresponding UTXO can't be spent in any other context until it's, uh, the, the head is finalized again. Yeah, Does, that's, right. that's, is, that's the idea of the of the thing, right? Or it's also so important. Can you? Yeah. So, is is it possible to commit, say, um, you know, another contract to kind of lock it up and prevent it from being interacted with? Um, or is there something to prevent that? Um, so, in in general, you know, if you if you have a, if one of these UTXOs, so, so there are like two cases. If these UTXOs are paid to pub key that you want to commit here, then it's only important that, you know, uh, the, the pub key under which um, the UTXO is locked uh, is also used to sign this commit transaction. Right? That's the, right. the, the simple thing. Like, now, yeah. So I'm, I'm just considering like a, a contract which, you know, as you described before, you have mm -hmm. the, the some kind of contract identifier and the data field is tracking the, the state of the contract. And assuming right. that it's something completely linear. Um, right, so the, right, so, so, so that- So it's kind of, no one should be able to take ownership of it, but anyone can extend it by creating a new transaction to modify the, the data field. Right, so the, this is just a, you know, if you look at these statements, it's just a special case of the general uh, validator UTXO, right? So, so the UTXOs, they are locked with a script. So if you want uh, to commit one of these UTXOs into the head, you you basically need to make a generic modification to it that will allow the UTXO to be spent uh, by such a commit transaction. Ah, okay. So it's, it's because you have this restriction that the validator stays the same that you can't do that. Um, yeah, for example, if, okay. you do, if you implement this uh, state machine using right. the uh, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. That makes a lot of sense. Thanks. No problem. Um, any other questions about this uh, part? Great. Um, then let's move on and uh, look at what happens inside the, uh, the head or off chain. Um, so 
what you start out with is this UTXO set U0, and that corresponds just to the you know union of all the UTXOs that were committed um, in the in the in the previous step here on the main chain. So this is what you start out with in the in the off-chain protocol, and now you know let's uh, let's say there is you know this guy here receives a transaction um, that he wants to have confirmed. So maybe this is what it looks like. Uh, so he will tell the other head members about this transaction and the other head members will check that, you know, it's valid and that it doesn't, you know, that it actually spends the UTXO that is part of the current UTXO set here. Um, and if this is good, they, you know, they sort of jointly create a, a multi-signature to confirm uh, this transaction. And then, you know, this keeps going. So maybe next time, you know, uh, this this head member here creates a transaction and basically by the same process, you know, uh, they create a multi-signature for this one. So, on. and if, uh, you know, if, if there are transactions that are independent of each other, you can also confirm them at the same time. So this can basically happen in parallel. So the, the process of creating such a multi-signature is basically a, a three round interaction. So if two transactions don't depend on each other, you know, there's nothing that prevents you from doing this in parallel. Um, and again, important here is to note that basically the, you use the exact, the exact same ledger model as on the main chain. So the transactions look exactly the same and uh, you know, the validation happens in exactly the same way. Um, so this is how transaction confirmation works. Now, um, in order to sort of reduce storage, uh, the members of the head protocol, they will also uh, occasionally do like snapshots. So for, for example, if you consider, you know, what is the UTXO set that corresponds to applying these first three transactions here, uh, let's call it U1. It's basically all that's shown in orange here. So, you know, maybe this person here, she uh, decides, okay, I wanna create a snapshot. So she will tell people which transactions that she wants to have included in the snapshot. And then together they create a multi-signature of this UTXO set U1 that corresponds to these three transactions applied. And uh, once you have this, all that you need to remember is actually this, U this UTXO set U1. And the transactions that got you there are, you know, they're not that important anymore. <clears throat> so, uh, a side note, if, uh, you know, it, it can happen that, you know, there are conflicting transactions in the sense that they try to spend the same UTXO. Um, and in that case, you know, maybe half of the head parties will sign one transaction and the other half will sign the other transaction. And because they don't sign conflicting transactions, um, none of them, uh, neither transaction will get like a, a full multi-signature or enough signatures to create a full multi-signature. So then you basically get, you get stuck. So you can also use this snapshot process to resolve these conflicts by basically allowing the, uh, the, the leader of the snapshot, in our case, it was uh, this lady here, uh, to decide which, uh, which of the conflicting transaction will make it and which will uh, be discarded. All right. So given you know, what we have so far, so basically the, the thing that you need uh, at any point, if at any point you decide you know, something is wrong or I'm done, I wanna leave, or if the others st stop cooperating with you, uh, you can take the current snapshot with this multi-signature and any you know, hanging transactions with, uh, with its multi-signature. And this will be sort of the short certificate that um, you will send back to the main chain. And <clears throat> so this will be here, right? So remember the main chain. So basically when you go from open to closed, um, you'll, you'll provide this as a certificate. And then, as I said, there will be this, this contestation phase where other head members can provide potentially newer uh, certificates um, and then there's the transition to, to final, which creates the UTXOs on the chain that correspond to 
uh, what is specified here. Um, maybe a few things we should say here. I mentioned this briefly before. Uh, you can actually make this process parallel so that you don't need uh, you know, O of N uh, of these transitions here where everybody gets to add their two cents about what is the new uh, certificate. You can actually do this in parallel uh, in a way that's similar to how we did these, uh, these commits here. Um, we can also, we, we do some trickery to keep these transactions sort of uh, the size of them at a manageable level. And uh, in case you, you know, your UTXO set off chain grows, there's also a way for basically to, to split this up into a bunch of transactions here at the end. So that um, even if your UTXO set is so large that it wouldn't fit into a single transaction, which would be necessary to do this in one transition, um, you can split it up into multiple transactions and still get it back to the main chain. All right. Um, so this is sort of uh, the important parts of, uh, of our construction. Um, are there any questions? Yeah, so uh, regarding the off-chain transitions, I'm used to having just uh, two parties, and, and so both of them know what is the current nonce in the evolution of the state change. But here you have multiple parties. So I'm imagining, like, for example, if we look at the, um, like, suppose the lady with um, um, gray hair, she mm -hmm. is adversarial. So she controls one of the UTXOs, and then she's transacting with uh, uh, the blonde and brown hair ladies. Uh, and she, like, they are creating one transaction let's say like yeah let's suppose that suppose that um like you have one transaction which is tx1 which is between the gray haired and the blonde lady and then there's another tx2 which is between the gray haired and brown haired lady and both of these like both of these transactions spend the same utxo but the the thus that is only known by the gray hair so oh, okay, so so maybe I wasn't clear about this. So the the important thing is that all of them are involved in creating multi signatures for all the transactions, right? Okay, so it's not just the parties that control the UTXOs incoming to each transaction; it's everyone. Everyone, I yeah. Uh, this is also so this not only fixes sort of the issue that you were hinting at, but also in general if we want to allow arbitrary contracts in this uh, off-chain protocol, you don't even know who's the owner of a UTXO, right? If it's logged by a script, you can't really tell who yes. I who's see. Uh, responsible. So the important thing really is that, you know, while, you know, if she wants, if she wants to spend something, she may create this transaction, but she will, inf she will inform all people about it. Um, who then uh, will jointly create this multi-sig. So that, that means that then everyone in the group, in the um, in this channel is aware of where we stand in terms of what is the current off-chain UTXO or e e UTXO. Right. Yeah, okay, yeah. thanks. So mm -hmm. I, I realize this isn't really the, the focus of this, but it, it seems to me like the, the idea of having an isomorphism between the the off-chain channels and the on-chain structure isn't really that it, it oh the fact that it's a utxo system doesn't seem that integral to me to that i guess it makes something simpler because you have a uh, much more well-defined structure in uh how things that like what, what the ordering constraints between transactions is for example but do you think it's plausible to use a similar approach to non-UTXO uh, um, so, designs? So I, I made like this slide. I think it's not impossible to do it, uh, but it's depending on, you know, it, the exact variant of your account based ledger, for example, um, it, it may be a little more tricky. So if you, um, you know, I guess this is just a sort of a very simple abstraction of the, the ledger state uh, in an account based ledger, right? So you'd have like, um, 12 coins under public key two, and then four coins in this public key seven. And then here are two uh, script accounts. They have like eight and 56 coins. And you also have this sort of, you know, the state of these, uh, of these contracts. And, you know, 
now if you have a transaction you might say you know i want to take something from this uh, script address and send it to this public key um, and the, again you have sort of this sort of space for witnesses or whatever and uh, the amount and then what happens is you know you run this uh, this script on the current state on, on this additional information row here. And then if the script accepts, it actually sort of out creates a new, it creates a new state uh, of the contract here, right? Um, now it's, uh, you know, uh, if, you, if you think about, is there now a way to check, check out a substate of this ledger in the, uh, in the accounts model, it's, uh, it, it's not that easy, right? I mean, uh, yeah, yeah, that, that's, that is one of the limitations, I guess it, it, but this is something you might be able to add in. It's more of a structural uh, yeah, limitation yeah. of the accounts model. I mean, it's, I don't think it's impossible, but it, it might be more cumbersome, yeah. right? Especially when, you know, maybe you can modify this one guy so that it's now you know you can't use it anymore until you know the certificate comes back from the from the off-chain protocol or something uh mm. so maybe you can do that but then when you want to put two of them into the same off-chain thing if i think it gets already a little more tricky right because then uh you know, yeah I, I guess the UTXO model is nice because you can just take a subset of the UTXO and lock it, and yeah, exactly. that's a sensible operation. Yeah, so that makes it a lot easier to, to okay. cut out a piece Thanks. of the ledger. Mm -hmm. um, right. So, um, any other questions about the protocol itself? Yeah, so your protocol here is based on some sort of uh, covenant, right? So same way that we have covenants in the Bitcoin's UTXO, here you say that the validator script ensures that the next validator script has a certain form, right? Mm -hmm. Then if the on-chain transactions have similar covenants. Like if I write a smart contract that says, okay, this money must go to the same script as I am, but then with some different state, if that's the case, then it will, it will not be easy to have my smart contract enter into your off-chain uh, contract anymore because it will uh, check yes. and will fail to see that it's, uh, it's according to the covenant, yeah. That's correct. Yeah. I, uh, so as a, as a general sort of solution, you may think of a, you know, uh, you, if, when you, I guess when you write your contract and going inside a, an off chain head is sort of an option for you, you can always, you know, have a generic sort of mod. you can apply generic transformation to your, to your script which is basically right. original script or you know enter into a head and then you could even like right so the basically this this uh channel system is not backwards compatible with older contracts that were written without it in mind basically you, you have to take that into account yeah. yes that's correct that makes sense. Yeah. okay which is probably desirable because otherwise you get potential denial of service to taxes i was worried about yeah, no, I, I don't think it's good in general. I agree. Um, if somebody can just take your smart contract and put it inside a head that you may not even have control over. Um, um, any other questions? All right, uh, maybe a few words about some related work. So there's the this uh, on on uh, related work on uh, multi-party state channels. So the, there's the sprites protocol um, where you basically deploy a contract on the main chain that then sort of governs your, your state channel. And so that, but they don't have the, this isomorphism. So basically the, so the ledger models or uh, that are on chain or off chain are not the same. And there's also no notion of, you know, uh, taking something from the main chain um, and then evolving it off chains. It's more like a, 
you have a specific contract that you're, you want to run fast so you can do that um, off chain and then fall back to the chain um, to this contract that you deployed in case something goes wrong. Um, so because of that, you also kind of have to fix at the beginning which what what, what exactly you're going to run um, off chain. Um, and so just like uh, our protocol, I guess uh, sort of their off chain protocol is, is also asynchronous. And then another uh, work that's relevant are multi party virtual state channels uh, by Jim Bovsky's et al. So they they built multi party state channels on top of pairwise state channels. Um, and you also have so basically these two restrictions that sort of you don't use the same ledger model and you need to know in advance uh, what you're going to compute off chain. Um, and here the off chain protocol is synchronous and uh, so it, it proceeds in, in rounds and uh, that makes it a bit slower than the sort of asynchronous variants uh, of sprites and, and these uh, fast isomorphic state channels. Um, all right, uh, so really, really briefly. So in order to sort of assess latency and throughput um, of, uh, of the off-chain part, um, instead of just doing some, you know, transactions per second thing, uh, we use baselines. Um, and this will give us sort of uh, something that doesn't depend on the architecture or where the architecture you run it on is, isn't all that important. So you can think of the baseline as like idealized versions of the protocol. So for example, one baseline, could, uh, we call it the universal baseline, is basically just, you know, how fast can you process transactions if all you care about is, you know, somebody verifies that, uh, you know, I, I send the transaction, if I have it to everyone, everybody verifies and, and sends back an acknowledgement. But nothing else has to be done, no signatures, no consensus, so it's sort of the, you know, the best you could you could ever hope for. Um, and so you sort of simulate this and you know it gives you gives you this black uh, baseline here. And then you uh, you know you can run your protocol and you can see how close does it get to the baseline. And uh, sort of how close it is to the baseline is the thing that you care about because that's kind of the physical limit, but it's not that important, you know, what kind of uh, an architecture you run it on. Uh, so compared to using the TPS metric, you know, you get more meaningful uh, um, experimental results. And so we did this for, uh, for the uh, uh, state channels that, or the, the off-chain protocol that we uh, developed. And uh, it, it seems that it, uh, you get quite close to the, the physical limits. All right, um, so I guess sum up real quick. So again, we get low latency and high throughput on in this off-chain protocol, uh, mostly because it's fairly simple and you don't have to serialize things. So you can actually confirm transactions in parallel when they don't depend on each other. Um, because we do these snapshots, uh, we, we don't have to uh, store all that much. We have the same ledger model on-chain and off-chain and we did these simulations that I just talked about. All right, so uh, I guess that's all I wanted to talk about. Happy to answer any more questions. Thanks, Andrew. So I guess the, the name of the paper, the isomorphic part, comes from the fact that off-chain and on-chain state transitions are the same? Yeah, that's how we chose that name. It's not, I... it's not a mathematical isomorphism or anything of the sort. No, it makes sense. It makes sense. And it's actually one of the, I guess, one of the um, things that differentiates you from uh, other solutions. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, any more questions? I guess. Uh... I guess uh, one question. Well, first of all, thanks for the talk. It was quite quite nice, actually. Um, thanks. So uh, just like, you know, for like a follow up, I mean, you have this committee of four and the example was these four people that have to agree on every single state and do the multi-signature. Um, so I guess that exactly the trust assumption is that, okay, it, either all of them sign or you have to go on chain where, you know, mm -hmm. even if one goes offline, then you also have to go on chain. So I, I'm wondering whether you are thinking of uh, ways to uh, relax this assumption. So you, when one goes offline, probably delegate 
the possibility of signing to the others or having more like a threshold way of signing or things, things like that. Um, so we, we haven't, we're not specifically looking into this right now, but you can, you can more or less run any kind of multi-party protocol in the head. Um, and then, you know, depending on what kind of uh, assumptions it requires, you, you get different file guarantees, right? But the sort of the, the concept of locking something on chain, maybe here, I'm thinking about the crash here. Um, the concept of taking something off chain by locking it on the main chain into a state machine that's like, uh, it's sort of yeah, generic in a way, right? Mm -hmm. I guess, exactly. I mean, I guess that one of the implications would be, of course, that uh, I mean, what you showed that probably the it uh, would be way uh, farther from the baseline, so it would be worse in, in practice. But you know, it's like the typical, I guess, the typical trade off between the trust assumption and how efficient it is, indeed. Mm -hmm. right? Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, any, anything else? All right. Um, all right. So thanks again for coming. Um, sure. Thank you for the wonderful presentation. That was quite interesting. I, I should, uh, I must agree with Pedro. Uh, so Thanks uh, once again, uh, Sandra. I think many people will be interested in watching. I already know that uh, Orpheus, who's working on state channels, uh, expressed interest in watching this later on. He couldn't make it. And some other people will also surely find it interesting. So um, once this is processed, I will put it up on the website. I'll, I'll actually contact you by email with, about that. Cool. Um, right. So yeah, thanks for the talk. Thanks everyone for attending. And uh, our, our next seminar is next week, Wednesday, one hour earlier so as usual usual time next week so i'll see you all there so thank you very much um and uh see you all next week have a great week right. bye thanks happy easter thank you thanks. Happy easter.